Today, what we're going to look at is principles of the United States Constitution. Think of principles as rules or regulations within the Constitution. So remember when we talked about the Constitutional Convention, we talked about how the Anti-Federalists wanted the Bill of Rights added. And the Federalists are saying you don't really need to add it. Here's why they don't feel you need to add it. It's because of all these principles. All these limits that are kind of built in to the Constitution, making certain that the government knows what the rules are. They understand that this is where they can't do something. This is where they're limited. So they kind of felt like this playbook, the U.S. Constitution, was a really good manual. It detailed all the things you could and couldn't do. So they felt like that Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, was unnecessary. But the Anti-Federalists finally get their way and the uh, Bill of Rights is added to the Constitution. So the principles are within the Constitution. The Bill of Rights is an addition to the Constitution. It is not original. So we're going to look at some of the principles of our Constitution today. The first principle we're going to look at is this thing called popular sovereignty. And when you look at popular, it means people. So um, and you, when you think of someone who's popular, a lot of people like them or, or they follow them or something like that. So popular. Then when you look at the word sovereignty, inside the word is this word called reign. And when you look at R-E-I-G-N, reign is rule. So in our country, people rule. And people rule because the power comes from people. So um, I have this Google Doodle, and it's the register the vote. So um, every year, you know, there's a big push for people to register the vote. And part of the reason is because you and I do rule, and we rule through our voting practices. So uh, there's lots of ways to register the vote. Um, some of the states you can register online, like at the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles. That is a federal law, so any federal, like, state government building should be able to help you register the vote, and that's a motor voting law. But we have recognized over the years that we need to increase, like, voter registration and access to voting for people. But... When they're talking about popular sovereignty, they're talking about you and I really are running this country and we are making the decisions about how our government is going to operate and how it's going to rule. Um, so when you register to vote and you exercise your right to vote, you go vote on election day, the majority is going to rule. So whoever gets the most votes will win. Um, and, you know, we talked about with the presidency, there's that little extra with the electoral college. But when you talk about like a law, when you're talking about a nominee being appointed to a Supreme Court or being appointed to a position within the president's cabinet, it will again be majority. You know, so whoever gets 51% or more is going to get the position or they're going to get that law passed. So when you look at this, this is what we're talking about. President Lincoln kind of said it best the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. So this is one of these things that when we're talking about you and I running the country, we are running the country because we have a voice. You know, one of the big complaints that the colonists had against Britain was that no taxation without representation. They didn't have a voice. But you do have a voice today. Now, whether you exercise it, whether you go and use it, you vote, is another question. So a really good example of popular sovereignty is voting. Um, and we vote in what we call primaries. So this is before your general election. And the general election is what we have in November. But we'll talk more about primaries. Primaries are what you witness in the spring. So typically in the spring and early summer, you will have candidates, lots of candidates who are Democrats and Republicans, asking you for your vote. And then out of the Democrats, you get the top person for the Senate position or the president position. And then the same thing for the Republicans, you would get the top people. And those would be the people who actually are going to run in the general election. So if you look at this primary, this time around in 2020, you had 
Joe Biden running, but you also had him opposing some other people. There were other people in the primaries. And as the months went on, some of those people dropped out. Um, and probably his heavier opponent was Bernie Sanders. And eventually Bernie Sanders kind of dropped out too. But Joe Biden won the Democrat primary because Democrat voters and voters, like we'll look more at like how primaries uh, work, but when you look at the Democrats, they decided that that was who they wanted to run in the general election. They voted. The general election is held in November, and it's going to determine who's actually going to get the position. And so um, that is a, we do general elections every two years. So it's not just for the presidency. We do them um, for the Senate, for the House members, for your governors of your state, for your local positions, your mayors, um, your city council. There's a lot of different positions that we are always voting in and out. Your board of education members. And that's going to happen at the general election. Another way that you can be a part of this ruling this country is through signing petitions. So, and I know online you get a lot of petitions, but you're asking the government for change. You're having your voice heard. And you can um, call for a referendum, a vote on these things. So there's lots of ways you and I run this country. The next principle of the Constitution is what we call limited government. Uh, the government is not all powerful, and no one, not even the president, is above the law. Now, over the years, uh, we've had you know some things that you guys probably know of impeachments. So when we look at this thing called the rule of law, the president, the vice president, you and me, we are all held to the same law, and that law is the Constitution. So no one can say that they're above the Constitution. So a, like what impeachment really is, a good example of limited government, is charges of wrongdoing. This is an indictment, charges. It's no different than somebody who would be getting arrested for some other, you know, criminal activity. Um, so when a president, an executive member, or a judicial branch member is accused of wrongdoing, we just call it impeachment. It just has a different word. So it's charges. Whenever someone's charged with anything in this country, they have the right to a trial. And it's the same thing with executives and judicial branch members. They have the right to trial as well. Um, so I gave you this example, this picture of President Andrew Johnson. Um, Johnson is the president after Lincoln is assassinated. So after President Lincoln is assassinated following the Civil War, President Johnson becomes the president. He was the vice president, so he becomes the president. When he becomes the president, he is not well liked, um, and he does something that Congress is going to go ahead and they're going to impeach him on. So they charge him of wrongdoing. He goes through trial, uh, but he is not removed from office. So you can be impeached, not found guilty, and not removed from office. So when you look at presidents, and um, we've had several have the impeachment proceedings done against them. So you had President Andrew Johnson, President Bill Clinton, and President Donald Trump have had impeachment proceedings, but none of them have actually been removed from office. So they got charged. Okay. The Constitution itself is really a very limited government example as well. You know, it does tell the government what they can and can't do. So kind of a good example of limited government. Uh, is when President Nixon is in office. When President Nixon is in office, um, you know, Watergate is going on, some bad things are happening, and President Nixon likes to say, um, you know, I'm, I have executive privilege. You can't really ask me to testify. You can't ask me to do this stuff. I'm the president. Um, and that's not the case. When the Supreme Court gets a hold of Nixon and, and the whole Watergate thing, he has to turn over those tapes with the Watergate investigation. He has to turn over that evidence. He can't say because he's the president, he has the right to not follow the law. So everybody has to follow the law. And, you know, following that, Nixon resigns from the presidency. Maybe he would have been impeached and removed. 
uh, but because he resigns, it kind of stops that whole process from going on. Then he gets a pardon, and that really does stop it. So the next principle of our Constitution is what we call separation of powers. Separation of powers is the three branches that they created. And remember, Article 1 creates the legislative branch, Article 2 is the executive branch, and Article 3 is the judicial branch. So in separation of powers, our government, our Constitution, it divides our government into three branches. And why you do it is to avoid tyranny or an absolute government. We don't want a King George III. We don't want a government that has one branch and it controls everything. You know, we don't want a dictator. So we've split up our government. And each of them kind of stay in these, like, lanes. So, like, why they're driving, why the legislative, why the executive and judicial are driving. They're driving straight in their lanes. There's no merging, okay? So they're not allowed, the executive can't merge over here. The legislative can't merge over here. Article 1, the legislative, they make our laws, and we call it Congress. And Congress is broken up into the Senate and the House. Article 2, the executive, they carry out the law. They enforce the law. So the president, the vice president, the cabinet, the executive agencies like the CDC, um, they would help out. The judicial, Article 3, judges and interprets the law. So this would be like the Supreme Court and all our other federal courts. Like there's a U.S. tax court. Uh, lots of different kinds of courts to specialize in, in different things. Okay. When you look at these separation of powers, it really leads to us to the fourth principle, checks and balances. So some stuff that people really don't understand about separation of power. The President of the United States is invited every year to speak to Congress and speak to you and me. It's called the State of the Union Address. So Congress has to invite him to travel from the White House down here to Congress and make that speech. He has to get an invite. He's not really supposed to just wander around Congress every single day because that would be, and it, it would be illegal. It would be him violating the separation of powers. So when the president wants to speak to Congress, he has to get invited to speak to Congress. Uh, he'll send an invite, you know, they'll invite him. Um, when, like, a senator or house member wants to speak to the president, they have to get invited to you send a request you get the invite we keep our branches separate same thing with like the supreme court so the president doesn't go to the supreme court and as a matter of fact supreme court justices rarely go to the white house either unless they're being invited for some sort of ceremonial thing so everybody kind of stays in their lane nobody merges because of the separation of powers the fourth principle is checks and balances. So our government is very limited, like it limits itself. So each branch can limit the power of another, and this prevents the majority from having too much power. So like the legislative has things it can do, the judicial has things it can do, and the executive has its things it can do, but they monitor each other. So when Congress, the House, and the Senate when they meet together, they're called Congress. They decide that they're going to pass the law to the president. So Congress can pass laws, so they send it to the president, and the president does have the right to veto the law. And when he vetoes the law, he is canceling the law. He says, this is bad, the people don't like it, they don't want it. So they can veto it. When the president vetoes a law, it can go back to Congress, and what Congress can do is they can override a veto. They just have to have enough votes. So if they override the president's veto, it can then go to the president and it's law. So if they override the veto, it becomes law anyway, and he or she will have to enforce it. Another thing would be like when the president appoints justices to the Supreme Court. When the president appoints justices, it has to go through Congress, and it really specifically goes through the Senate. So the Senate is going to approve any presidential appointment, and they're going to do that to check his power of appointment to the Supreme Court. 